Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Romney, and I'm the Community Education Manager here at the Myotonic Distribute Foundation. I am very excited to welcome you to our Ask the Expert webinar today on DM in the Heart. Before we begin, I would love to tell you a little bit about the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation. We envision a world with treatments and a cure for myotonic dystrophy. Our mission is community, care, and a cure. We support and connect the myotonic dystrophy community. We provide resources and advocate for care, and we accelerate research towards treatment and a cure. MDF is here to support you. We have toolkits and publications, including resources for care providers and families, like the new DM in the Heart Community Guide, our anesthesia guidelines, the MDF toolkit, the mental health guide, clinical care recommendations, and resources for clinicians and researchers, including grant funding opportunities for DM research. We also have support groups that are led by trained community volunteers, and our support programs create a safe space to network, learn, and share. Our digital academy has hours of educational and inspirational videos by DM experts on demand. You can also find all of our upcoming support groups, conferences, webinars, and more through our calendar of events on our website. We would love for you to stay in touch with us, follow us on social media, and make sure you're up to date on all things MDF and DM. You can find MDF on Instagram, X, Facebook, and LinkedIn. I want to briefly highlight a few exciting upcoming MDF webinars. So next week, we have our final MDIM Awareness Month webinar, Myotonic Dystrophy in Motion. It'll be our virtual Zumba class on Wednesday, July 31st. So there's still time to sign up and you'll see some links to be able to sign up for these webinars in the chat. Uh, we've also got our upcoming Meet the Drug Developers webinar that will feature PepGen on August 2nd. We'd love to see you there. I also would like to offer a big thank you to Avidity Bioscience who is the sponsor for this Ask the Expert webinar. And before we begin, I am really excited to spotlight our brand new DM in the Heart community guide. Hopefully some of you have seen this guide. It is up on our website and was just published last week. It's for individuals living with myotonic dystrophy um, because with uh, folks living with myotonic dystrophy, heart issues can pose a serious threat to health. Since the heart itself is a muscle, people living with DM1 or DM2 can experience cardiac issues. So this resource aims to help people living with DM to understand heart health risks and how they're managed. And I have to say, we could not have developed this resource without Dr. William Grow, who was the primary author and contributor to this guide, and we're really excited to have him join us for this webinar today. Thank you all as well for joining us from around the world. Today's program is an Ask the Expert webinar that will feature a presentation from Dr. Grill followed by time for a Q&A. We do ask that you use the Q&A function to ask your questions and they'll be sent directly to Dr. Grill and myself. Dr. Grill will do his best to answer as many questions as we can today. To ask questions, you'll click the, que the Q&A button, type your question into the text field, and then click send. You can also send questions anonymous anonymously if that is your preference. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Grow. Dr. William Grow is a certified internal medicine specialist, cardiologist, and cardiac electrophysiologist. He has been involved in providing clinical care of patients with myotonic dystrophy and cardiac issues since 1994. Dr. Groh has conducted clinical research to determine how best to assess the heart in myotonic dystrophy. He led a, a multi-center group assessing cardiac outcomes in individuals with myotonic dystrophy type 1. He was the lead author on an international consensus document on cardiac care for patients with neuromuscular disorders published recently. Dr. Groh is currently Chief of Medicine at the Ralph H. Johnson VAMC in Charleston, South Carolina, and holds an academic appointment at the Medical University of South Carolina. Dr. Groh continues to support to provide care for patients in cardiac, with cardiac and cardiac arrhythmia issues. 
So I will now turn the time over to Dr. Groh. Thank you, Emily. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to the webinar today. I'm very pleased to uh, to uh, participate in this webinar. Um, we're actually using this webinar as kind of a framework uh, with the slides to kind of uh, look at the DM and the heart community guide. So I'm using that uh, to kind of explain some aspects of care. Uh, we received some of your questions already, and so we'll try to answer that a bit during uh, this presentation and then also uh, uh, with the question and answer uh, during follow up. So again, as Emily said, I am currently uh, chief of medicine uh, at, a, at a VA hospital in Charleston, South Carolina, and I also work at the Medical University of South Carolina uh, and uh, continue to see patients, including, uh, you know, continuing to see patients with neuromuscular diseases and um, with cardiac electrical and other cardiac problems. Next slide, please. So um, I wanna thank the group that helped with this community guideline. Um, everybody here was instrumental in uh, different aspects of making sure this is useful um, to the Myotonic group. And so we thank you for that. Next slide. So, a lot of people, I think, will ask the question with myotonic dystrophy, what's going on with the heart abnormalities that we see in it? Um, you know, as kind of simply put here, the heart is a muscle and myotonic dystrophy affects muscles and, and therefore it can affect the heart. We see that with many of the neuromuscular diseases. The exact way that the heart is affected is a bit different than how it affects uh, the skeletal muscle. Uh, but some of the endpoints of the problem remains the same. And therefore, uh, as you're taking care of the multi-systems that are involved with myotonic dystrophy, you have to remember the heart. Um, and that's one of the things that I've really been working on for um, all of the years I've been kind of taking care of patients with myotonic dystrophy. You might ask, well, how did you ever start with your interest in myotonic dystrophy. And if you ask a doctor that question often, it's gonna be related to um, a patient I saw. And uh, I was actually uh, in Portland, Oregon at the time and was finishing up my cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology fellowship. And I saw a young woman with myotonic dystrophy type one who had serious heart rhythm problems. And uh, we treated her and uh, it was different for a young person to have these type of problems. So I went into the literature and I looked and saw what, what do we know about myotonic dystrophy in the heart? And there was relatively little information. And so I realized at that time that uh, we needed to get more information. And uh, after I left Portland, Oregon, I went to Indianapolis, Indiana, and was there for 18 years uh, and started almost immediately when I got there, a large study, uh, and uh, that was multi-center, multi-center throughout the United States and Canada. And we identified patients with myotonic dystrophy and looked how they were being treated for their heart issues. Uh, and we learned a lot of information related to that and published a lot of that. And our goal actually was to help doctors take care of patients with myotonic dystrophy. So as you know, there's two different types of myotonic dystrophy, type one and type two. Type one is most common in the United States. Uh, there are some areas where type two is more common, some parts of Europe, um, but in the United States, it's type one. Both of them can experience heart issues. In general, patients with myotonic dystrophy type one typically have, are at a higher risk of heart, heart issues. And if patients with myotonic dystrophy type two do experience heart issues, they typically get it later in life than patients with myotonic dystrophy type one. Next slide. So just to go a little bit through the anatomy of the heart, um, I don't know if you looked at this in your high school anatomy classes or anything like that, but the heart has, uh, in, in humans, has, has four chambers, uh, the two atrium, which are the upper chambers of the heart, and blood enters into the atrium from the different blood vessels. 
uh, the left atrium, the right atrium, and then is pumped through the valves uh, in the heart, uh, the tricuspid and mitral valve, uh, and uh, pumped into the ventricles that then pumps out to uh, the rest of the body. The right ventricle pumps through the lungs and the left ventricle pumps through the, the rest of the body, essentially through the, to the brain and all the rest of the um, abdominal organs, uh, into the limbs and all those other areas. Now, the heart is an incredibly interesting uh, organ, um, something I was always interested. I, my background is actually in electrical engineering, and the heart itself has its own electrical system. And that electrical system controls the heartbeat or the heart rhythm. Uh, the heartbeat starts in the right atrium, if it's normal, and then spreads through the rest of the uh, rest of the heart, um, and uh, so that uh, those cells essentially allow the heartbeat to move through the heart and synchronously time the contraction of the heart to make sure that the heart can be most efficient at pumping blood. So if you want to make something uh, akin to an analogy to the car, it would be the wiring and the spark plugs essentially that allow the motor to run. And it does seem, and we, we, we've known for quite a long time, that the problems with myotonic dystrophy tend to first affect the heart's electrical system. These are specialized cells that have high oxygen requirements and may have different proteins and channels in them. And uh, the myotonic dystrophy abnormalities tend to affect that. Um, now, the other part of the heart, of course, is, is the electrical system controls it, but it also has to pump blood. And so those are those are other cells, and those cells can be affected as well by myotonic dystrophy, but it's less common. Next slide. So again, back to the electrical system, more common in myotonic dystrophy than problems with the pumping system. And uh, it, it, you've probably read about this. Uh, we use the word, term arrhythmia, which is an electrical issue causing the heartbeat to beat abnormally, essentially. And in general, we kind of divide those into two different problems, uh, bradyarrhythmia or bradycardia, that means too slow of a heartbeat. And I've given you several examples uh, um, of different names that you might have heard. Sinus bradycardia, that's a, a normal location of the heartbeat starting, but simply too slow. Atrial ventricular block is where the wiring between the upper and the lower chamber don't does not allow the heartbeat to move through normally. Heart block can also occur in the lower chambers of the heart. Uh, we call that right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block. There's something called left anterior fascicular block. So those may be terms that you hear as well. On the opposite side, the heart can be too fast. And we call that a tachyarrhythmia or tachycardia. Um, if that tachycardia is located in the atrium or in the middle of the heart, we call that the AV node, then it's termed a supraventricular tachycardia. That means above the ventricle. Uh, and uh, th th there may be sp special types of these as well. Um, and some of the different names for those supraventricular tachycardias include atrial fibrillation. This is the most common abnormal heartbeat that actually occurs in myotonic dystrophy. Atrial flutter is a kind of a cousin of atrial fibrillation, but it's a more organized rhythm. Atrial tachycardia is a fast heartbeat coming from an abnormal area of the atrium. And then we have the lower chamber arrhythmias as well, and we define those as ventricular in origin. So those would be ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And ventricular fibrillation is an abnormal chaotic rhythm of the lower chamber where the heart, instead of pumping blood, actually just quivers. And so no blood is pumped out. And if this happens, uh, the body can shut down almost immediately. And if that heart is not restarted in a short period of time, anywhere between four to six minutes or so, it can lead to irrevocable damage. And the risk of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation is 
one of the reasons that we actually consider the implantable cardioverter defibrillator in patients, that's, and we'll go through this a little bit more in the in further down the slides, but that's a device that actually can help to uh, treat and monitor the heart for either, either a too slow of a heartbeat or too fast of a heartbeat. And again, we'll talk about that further. Next slide, please. Again, um, so th there can be problems again with the kind of more common cells in the heart. These are the pumping cells, essentially. Um, these are less common in myotonic dystrophy than the electrical system, but we definitely see these. And we do know that if patients do get pumping problems, um, those can be serious and uh, have to be really paid attention to. Often the pumping problems uh, will occur in parallel with also electrical problems so that, you know, if we do see even a small amount of pumping problems, uh, we typically watch out for the electrical problems as well. Uh, so the problems related to a weak heart muscle are, it is called a cardiomyopathy. So that may be a term that you've heard from your doctor or, um, you know, uh, may, perhaps maybe read in the literature. Um, if the pumping issues continue, there can be a risk of something called heart failure, which is essentially the inability of the heart to effectively pump blood out to the rest of the body. And that can lead to symptoms such as edema or swelling of the legs, uh, problems with um, shortness of breath and exercise intolerance. Um, these can be really difficult to figure out sometimes in patients with neuromuscular disease because we have in parallel some of the problems with the skeletal muscles that can lead to some of the same symptoms. So that's one of the reasons that, you know, in mitotic dystrophy and some of the other muscular dystrophies, we have to be really careful about how we uh, uh, basically diagnose and watch for heart problems. Next slide. So what are some symptoms that could occur for heart issues? We talked a little bit about some of those, um, especially for heart rhythm disturbances or arrhythmias, people can feel faint. Uh, we call that, of course, is commonly called dizziness, or they can actually lose consciousness. And the medical term for losing consciousness and you know, and kind of falling to the ground is, is syncope. So um, people can also get fluttering or pounding hearts sensation. Um, that term is commonly called palpitations. And that can show, be signs of, of an arrhythmia happening. Uh, and again, the doctors should take that seriously and uh, evaluate for that. Uh, and as we talked about earlier regarding the heart failure, uh, difficulty breathing, we call that the medical term is dyspnea. We can also see things like difficulty breathing if the heart's out of rhythm, for example, with atrial fibrillation. Because when you, you have an electrical problem like atrial fibrillation, although it doesn't necessarily cause fainting spells, it can lead to problems with uh, the heart pumping as effectively as it's able to do and not enough blood flow essentially to kind of keep things going well, uh, especially with exercise. Now, in, in myotonic dystrophy, a lot of times heart issues can be asymptomatic, meaning we can see disturbing or, or abnormal findings on different testing, but patients have no symptoms. And one of the things I think we've shown over time is we can't ignore those type of things because sometimes that's the first piece of information that we'll get that something serious is going on and we have to deal with it before people do become symptomatic uh, because unfortunately, sometimes the first symptoms can be can be life-threatening, uh, you know, quite dangerous. So, so that's why uh, sometimes uh, you may not... Uh, actually uh, have uh, issues with uh, uh, things that occur uh, and, um, and, and and we, again, might you might be surprised, in fact, when the doctor says, well, I see this and, and I'm concerned about this and, and, you know, you don't have any symptoms. Next slide. So what kind of doctors treat heart issues? Sometimes Primary care doctors, especially if they're internal medicine specialists, they may be comfortable treating some heart issues. And, um, you know, if if doctors understand myotonic dystrophy in the heart and, you know, many times you may actually just go to your general doctor and have the EKG done. 
you know, and if that's shared with perhaps a specialist and, and, and things look good, you may not necessarily need to see someone, especially a patient with, uh, you know, who's younger typically, which is less likely to have heart issues. Um, in general, the way I've treated over the years is um, I really have a partnership with my neuromuscular specialists. And I like to see all of the patients um, with my time dystrophy so we can have the discussion about heart issues and people can become informed. You know, I think it's true that we all have to be our own best doctor. And so that if people can be informed, they can watch out for things over the years. So especially like an early visit. So typically, uh, especially when I was at Indiana University, I would work closely with our neuromuscular specialist who saw patients and uh, we would plan the evaluation. So um, if you're going to see a cardiologist, then really there's two different cardiologists you could see. A general cardiologist is basically that's an expert in heart and blood vessel disease. And they typically will also deal with heart rhythm disturbances. They may not have all the tools that the cardiac electrophysiologist has, which we'll discuss next, but often can definitely do certain things that can help assess um, the heart. Um, um, there are some excellent general cardiologists and, you know, I continue to practice both cardiac electrophysiology and uh, do general cardiology work. So, so I think, um, you know, if you're, if you're seeing someone and they see comfortable with how uh, an understanding of how the heart's affected by myotonic dystrophy, you know, that's, that's a very reasonable thing. So this, the specialist um, in heart rhythm disturbance is called the cardiac electrophysiologist. And so the word electrical, of course, dealing with electrical problems of the heart. Um, and we, we specialize in both the diagnosis and then the advanced treatment of arrhythmias. Uh, typically, if you're going to have an EP study done or you're going to have an ablation done, those are going to be done by a cardiac electrophysiologist. Um, if you have a pacemaker implant, sometimes there's some general cardiologists that are comfortable with that. Um, generally, if you're having a implanted cardioverter defibrillator, that again is usually a cardiac electrophysiologist. Next slide. Okay, so as we talked about earlier, I think determining your heart health is important if you've been diagnosed with myotonic dystrophy. Um, and so a cardiac evaluation, either, either again, if you're, if your general doctor is comfortable, um, you know, if you are seeing a neuromuscular specialist or a neurologist, ask them who they're comfortable in sending, um, to you to see, uh, hopefully they have a partnership with someone with expertise in, in heart issues, because many of the neuromuscular diseases, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Becker muscular dystrophy, and some of the other muscular dystrophies also have heart problems. So uh, typically, we're always going to start by uh, obtaining a medical history and determining what symptoms people have. Um, examination is still important. And, you know, when I examine people, I also, I didn't look, look just at the heart, but I also wanted to see how things were going with skeletal muscles and, and weakness and how was people's gait and how were they doing other things, right? And then finally, specialized testing that we do, including such simple tests really as the electrocardiogram. You may see that um, abbreviated either as ECG or EKG. Um, uh, and uh, again, uh, if specialized tests uh, are being done, that typically will go to uh, uh, most likely a cardiac electrophysiologist. Next slide. All right, so the electrocardiogram is probably our most simple test. And, you know, in our, in our study, we showed the value of the electrocardiogram for making decisions about how to treat patients with myotonic dystrophy. And this was published actually in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. And I think it was a very important paper uh, to determine how to assess heart, heart health in myotonic dystrophy. The 12 lead electrocardiogram, that's the standard electrocardiogram. I mean, so the ability to do the electrocardiogram has been around since about the early 1900s. So a test that we've had for a long time. 
but it provides really a snapshot of what the heart rhythm is. Okay, so it tells us where the heartbeat is coming from, how is it getting through the rest of the heart, and and what's it what's it doing? Um, you know, is it an abnormal heartbeat? Uh, uh, is it too fast? Is it too slow? So it's a very important test, and again, it has prognostic significance in patients with myotonic dystrophy. Remember that in general, the 12 electrocardiogram that's done at your doctor's office is about a 10 second snapshot. So it's a very short period of recording. So often we'll actually do longer monitoring as well. And these, there can be different devices for this. Um, some of them are worn. And in fact, one of them is actually implanted under the skin and monitors the heartbeat for up to several years, basically. Um, so the names of some of these tests could include things like a Holter monitor. There's a brand name of a test called a Zeal monitor that you can use for up to 14 days. And again, this implanted device that monitors the heart rhythm for longer, we call those insertable loop recorders. Next slide. I just wanted to show you an example of an electrocardiogram. This is a patient with my time dystrophy that I saw. And um, I'm showing you two electrocardiograms um, and we won't go into this to too depth, but what I want to show here is basically uh, over a period of about six years, there was a, a significant progression in, in heart abnormalities. And you can tell that actually based on how wide that large kind of mid squiggle is essentially. And I, you know, from this, I can see where the heartbeat is starting, how fast the heartbeat is, uh, how it's getting through the rest of the heart. So very important information. All right, next slide. Now, so that looks at the electrical system. Um, almost always in patients with myotonic dystrophy, I will do some imaging studies as well to look at how the heart is pumping. The, and the most simple of those tests is an ultrasound test of the heart called an echocardiogram. Uh, and we can actually do co computerized tomography or CT or, or CAT scan of the heart, sometimes with contrast given as well. And uh, also... Uh, there can be MRI or magnetic resonance imaging of the heart. Um, the MRI tends to be, it's the most sensitive test to see cardiac abnormalities uh, of these. It can show minor abnormalities and it's a very useful test to show if there's some abnormalities. One thing that I, you know, I have found is that often we'll see some minor abnormalities almost in everyone. And so the question is how exactly to use that information to say like, what's our next step? So, and that's not necessarily clear, but if we wanna look and see what's, if there's any cardiac involvement at all, the MRI is a, is a good test. In general, if patients are doing well and their EKG is looking good, I start with the echocardiogram. If I don't see any significant abnormalities, that's gonna allow me to determine how I, I'm gonna kind of treat the patient and, um, and you know, how often we're going to see them, what other testing we need to do. Um, so I, I reserve the MRI testing for cases where I have mixed information about what, what to do next. And, um, you know, the, there can be some useful information that we can get from, um, you know, making determinations of should someone receive a pacemaker or an implanted defibrillator based on the MRI. Next slide. All right, so this is a test, again, that's mostly done by cardiac electrophysiologists. This is called an electrophysiologic study, or EPS. And you can see the document here, those, the little red lines. Those are actually catheters that are in the heart. And they're essentially little electrical cords, essentially, that we put through a vein, generally. You can put it through the artery as well. And those actually go into the heart and... What this allows us to do is it can help us to look not kind of at the surface of the heart that we do with the electrocardiogram, but we can look at the local electrical system of the heart and see exactly where there's an issue or problem. Um, we can check to see once if there's abnormal heart rhythms. If we see an abnormal heart rhythm, we can diagnose the specific location of a heart. And the other thing we can do actually is we can, we can put stress on the heart, you could say, in a very controlled situation by pacing the heart and making sure that the heart is doing well, 
not just at a slow, regular, you know, resting heartbeat, but if you have to go out and, you know, run away from, I don't know, something and uh, your heartbeat has to go up. So, so it's, it's, it's a way of actually kind of stressing the heart and looking to see and putting the heart essentially through its paces. Now, the other thing that can, we can do is if we do see an abnormal heart rhythm, uh, we can also treat the heart rhythm abnormality by something called catheter ablation. And catheter ablation is essentially either heat or cold energy applied to the tip of the catheter that essentially will kind of either cauterize or freeze an area of the heart that where the abnormal heartbeats come coming from, potentially curing the problems. Now, are there any downsides to EP studies? Well, one of the things, of course, is just a little bit like the electrocardiogram, an EP study gives us just a snapshot of heart abnormalities at one time in a person's life. And one of the things about myotonic dystrophy is we know it's not a static disease. Unfortunately, cardiac involvement or heart involvement in myotonic dystrophy tends to get worse as people get older. And you know, one of the questions that uh, that was asked was how many people what percentage of people with myotonic dystrophy have heart abnormalities? And, you know, if, if, if it's a relatively young group of people, it's a small percentage. As you get into middle age and older, it tends to be a higher number. Um, and, you know, for example, in our study uh, uh, of about 400 patients with myotonic dystrophy, we saw that about 40% of patients who were in the middle age group had some abnormality uh, in their heart, that was indicative of uh, a, a myotonic dystrophy effect on the heart. So, so the EP study basically gives, just gives us one period of time and one snapshot of how the heart is doing. And so, so it can be very reassuring. But what we do know is that, that if, if cardiac disease does advance, people, can, people could have a normal EP study at some point. And, you know, if the cardiac disease advances, they could later on have heart rhythm problems, arrhythmias, and, um, you know, that, that, that EP study then um, uh, d doesn't reflect anymore uh, the truth of what's going on with those people's hearts. So again, it's relatively time limited. That's one of the reasons too that I do like, you know, using the electrocardiogram um, we, I definitely have used EP studies over time. Uh, you know, there's some large studies, mostly from Europe, showing the value of the EP study for making determinations of whether to put a pacemaker or not, people. And that's some very strong data. So, you know, and there was one other question I think that was asked about what is the indication for an EP study? And in general, the indication for an EP study is people that show evidence of at least moderate abnormalities on their EKG that is concerning and where you want some further information from the EP study to decide if they should receive a pacemaker or if they should receive an implantable cardioverter or defibrillator or if they need a catheter ablation. Um, and so typically if, you know, the EKG is completely normal or, or near normal, that might not be the right time to consider the EP study. Um, all right, thank you. Next slide. So how will I be treated? Um, I changed this slide a little bit from, uh, from what uh, initially was in there. Um, a good test result, I guess, continued monitoring. I think, you know, uh, I, if, I saw, if I saw my tonic patients and everything was completely normal, I would often, if possible, see them back every two years because I think that was probably enough time. Um, a lot of times uh, people wanted to see me back once a year and I was absolutely happy to do that as well. So I think an annual heart health test um, is reasonable. Again, if you have a good internal medicine specialist, you may see them for the electrocardiogram uh, and you know definitely talk to people if you have any change in any symptoms or anything like that. So an abnormal test result, I think it's, what, what's going to happen is has to be based on what is found in the severity. So it's going to be fairly common for people to have some minor abnormalities on their EKG. And I think watchful waiting 
and further testing uh, may be indicated at that point. Um, for the, for those of who who have had, you know, uh, EP studies or pacemaker implants or defibrillator implants, those have their own risks associated with them. And while they're appropriate in the right population, we don't want to do that in people that don't need it yet at that point. So, and that's a very difficult decision sometimes. So, uh, you know, I I was uh, always conservative about how I treated patients with myotonic dystrophy. I wanted to make sure that they would get benefit from what we were doing. Uh, and so, you know, I might see people a little bit more often and, you know, maybe I'd have someone come back and get an electrocardiogram in three to six months uh, uh, before we made decisions about what to do. Medications can be can be helpful as well. Um, so medis medicines, for example, um, or SVT can be used. And I think there was a question about that as well. Medicines can be used to treat SVTs. Commonly, these are medicines like uh, we call beta blockers or calcium channel blockers sometimes can be used for some of them. Uh, and sometimes uh, sometimes people undergo catheter ablations if they have a rhythm that is especially bothering them. Uh, one important point is uh, it is very important for patients who have atrial fibrillation to consider anticoagulation medicines. Uh, these are medicines that essentially thin the blood. It's, it's the, the common way of talking about it that make sure that blood clots cannot form. People with atrial fibrillation are at risk of blood clots because the upper chambers of the heart are not pumping in an organized fashion. And um, so they uh, that, that can lead to some stasis of blood in those areas and a blood clot can form in there. If that blood clot forms in there, works its way into the ventricle and then out into the body. And if it gets to the brain, that's a stroke, essentially. If it's a, if, it, if, if that if that blood clot goes to the foot, then it's what we call a peripheral emboli. So both very dangerous. So so in general, patients with atrial fibrillation will be on a, ty a type of blood pressure, uh, blood thinner medicine. And uh, those, are, those are common. I just wanted to mention one word about mexilatine. Mixilatine um, is used for patients with myotonia. And interesting enough, my mixilatine was initially uh, uh, developed actually as an antiarrhythmia medicine. And it has, so it has some antiarrhythmia effects as well. And if you, if your doctor, your neurologist wants to put you on mixilatine because of spasm or, or myotonia issues, then that would prompt um, usually a more aggressive evaluation for the heart because, uh, again, that, that effect on the heart of mixilatine can, can uh, increase the likelihood of problems. Um, so, so uh, but, but it's, been, it's been a very helpful medicine for people that have uh, really symptomatic myotonia, and so we I work closely with uh, with my neurologist uh, if they want to put someone on mixilatine. We talked about some of the procedures again, uh, the EP study or electrophysiologic study that um, uh, it can be a diagnostic test again, looking at different things to make decisions about things or catheter ablations, and finally the cardiac devices that we use. Um, uh, uh, are something that's commonly used in myotonic dystrophy. Next slide, please. So, what are what are the devices? Well, and we don't have this on the slide, but one of the devices, of course, that is implanted is all we talked about. That that's the implantable or insertable loop recorder, and that's just a small device that goes under the skin, and it does not actually go through any. Uh, and it doesn't have any leads associated with it. And that just monitors the heartbeat for a longer period of time. Um, the other devices actually kind of treat heart rhythms as well. And these implantable devices, sometimes you may see these abbreviated as CIED, cardiac implantable electronic devices. Um, again, these are devices that consist generally of a pulse generator and wires. These wires are called leads. And these leads go into, into the heart and can maintain a, a normal heart rhythm. There's actually uh, a smaller pacemaker 
uh, that's actually implanted directly in the heart and doesn't need a lead associated with that, that they call that a leadless pacemaker. So that's another one that, that we're using more now. Now the pacemaker actually, that's again, that's only able to treat a slow heartbeat. Uh, when the heartbeat drops down too low, it, it receives the signal that the heart beats too low and it paces the heart in order to get that heartbeat back to a normal beat, essentially. Now, the implanted cardioverter defibrillator, implantable cardioverter defibrillator, also abbreviated sometimes as an ICD, that device can treat both slow and fast heartbeats, meaning it has every implantable cardioverter defibrillator has some pacing capability in it. Um, but it also has the ability to treat the tachycardias or the tachyarrhythmias. And it can do that in two ways. One is it can pace the heart at a faster beat than what the tachycardia is going. And that can cause that abnormal tachycardia to stop. Or the second way, the device can actually shock the heart, essentially like an internal paramedic, essentially, and, and, sh and can shock the heart back to normal. All right. There is a type of implantable cardioverter defibrillator that's um, that's called a, a sub-Q defibrillator, and that's implanted in a little different area. Uh, that, although that has some minor pacing capability, it's not as effective uh, in pacing as the we call the transvenous defibrillator. So it's and, and it's used very infrequently in myotonic dystrophy, and in fact. In our international consensus document that we published in 2022, it was recommended that those devices not be used in patients with myotonic dystrophy, and that if an implanted cardioverter defibrillator was to be used, it was best to put in the transvenous device with the leads. Next slide. All right, so if you have an EP study or if you have a pacemaker or defibrillator implant. In general, you're gonna need some form of anesthesia that can be the local anesthesia, but often other medicines to help you, you know, either be asleep or feel sleepy. And I think this is an important point and something that I always watched out for is that um, patients with myotonic dystrophy have a higher risk of anesthesia in that it may not wear off as quickly and if people have problems with their respiratory muscles, it could exacerbate some of their problems. And so some of the breathing issues that people have um, can be made worse with anesthesia. Uh, the My Time Tissue Foundation actually felt this was important enough. And I agree that they put out anesthesia guidelines uh, that patients can share with their anesthesiologist if they need anesthesia for any reason not necessarily just for a pacemaker or defibrillator or other medical cardiac procedures, but any other type of thing. So, and I think the medical alert card uh, regarding this too. And, you know, if you let your anesthesiologist know about myotonic dystrophy, hopefully they will know about that. Uh, and um, uh, our, their, their understanding of those issues, um, that's very helpful. One point I, I, I always practice is when I put pacemakers in, sometimes in patients that do not have neuromuscular diseases, I don't have a separate anesthesiologist, but have uh, my nurse in the EP lab monitoring uh, the, the minor sedation that we need to use. For patients with myotonic dystrophy, I always partner with an anesthesiologist because I wanna make sure that if there's any signs of any respiratory problems, that the anesthesiologist can address those as quickly as possible. Next slide. So I guess, you know, what's the summary a little bit? How can you support your heart health, essentially? I think it's important to report any symptoms to your cardiologist or your primary care doctor. Um, uh, the My Time Tissue Foundation has provided clinical care recommendations for cardiologists. Um, again, 
I think some of the work that we have done, some of the work that the European doctors have done, have really focused the attention of cardiac electrophysiologists on that, yes, patients with myotonic dystrophy are a special population that I need to address and make sure I understand the heart issues they can have. And so, for example, that 2022 uh, international consensus document published by the Heart Rhythm Society. Uh, again, this was mostly for uh, cardiac electrophysiologists, but even you know documents for general cardiology are addressing the issues. So if the doctors are keeping up on the literature and treatment for patients, they should be able to see and uh, hopefully address problems. I, there was a question about how how best to have a conversation with your medical provider regarding your heart health and myotonic dystrophy. I mean, I think it's the same things that we use for kind of any conversation with a medical provider. You need to prioritize your own concerns. You need to ask the right questions. You definitely need to let people know about any symptoms. And you have to feel that you can work collaboratively with that doctor. So it really does take a team approach, I think, to take care of all the different systems involved by my kind of dystrophy. And so I've always found that it's worked best if, you know, I collaborate uh, as the cardiologist with my neuromuscular specialist and my neurologist. And, you know, we had at Indiana University when I was there, we had a pulmonary specialist on the team. We had, you know, the neurology specialist, we had the cardiologist and, and anybody else that we kind of need to make sure that that collaborative care works and and patients were involved in this and um you know the one of the things that doctors talk about right nowadays is shared decision making with patients okay so i i should provide you the most information i can about what's going on with your medical care and what i recommend but then you have to understand all of that and then ask me questions if there's things you don't understand. And then together we can make a decision about what the next step is. And, you know, for some patients with myotonic dystrophy, it can be hard because we don't actually have clear indications for absolutely who needs a pacemaker or who needs a defibrillator. So, so often this shared decision-making and this discussion is very important. And so, you know, that's one of the things I always did. And I made sure that I had a nice long visit in clinic with my patients to be able to discuss all of these things uh, and uh, and make sure that we were equal partners in, in, in making decisions. I think you have to stay on top of any of the testing in general, we're recommending an EKG typically every year. Again, if things look really good, it could be uh, two years. If there's abnormalities found um, more frequently than that. I, I typically, if cardiac imaging looks good, including an echocardiogram, I'll repeat that typically every two to four years or so. And, um, uh, you know, again, symptoms or other concerns uh, that's something that we would repeat uh, more frequently. Um, you know, I think you have to make sure that your doctor feels comfortable uh, with uh, treating the issues. And, um, you know, I hopefully, uh, it, you know, if you're seeing a neurologist um, or have a good relationship with a primary care doctor, they'll have a cardiologist that they recommend that hopefully understands things as well. Next slide. All right, so that's that's what we've got. That this is that this is kind of a little bit a deep dive into the community guide, um, and so I hope I hope that information was helpful, and we can definitely now answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gro. I just wanted to remind everyone to ask questions that you may have using that Q and A feature. I already see. Quite a few great questions coming in. So thanks to those who have already submitted questions through typing into that text field and then submitting. And just a reminder, you can submit those questions anonymously as well if that is your preference. So let's go ahead and jump in to the Q&A portion of our webinar today. I'm going to start off. We did have some 
um, pre-submitted questions that I want to make sure get addressed as well. So I want to start off with a question. Um, this individual talks about how they are a caregiver for their aging parent with DM, and they are wondering how they can best support their parent's heart health. Right. Okay. Well, one thing I just want to address real quickly, of course, is that I am so happy to do this webinar and to provide this information, but realize, of course, is that I'm not an individual patient's doctor at this point, um, so that we're kind of providing more general information. And so what I recommend or what, um, you know, what's recommended even in the community guide may not necessarily always be appropriate to every patient. So you should definitely talk with your own care team about that. So, but uh, in that light, so, you know, unfortunately, um, my tonic dystrophy tends to be a progressive disease. Uh, the involvement of the skeletal muscle tends to get worse as people get older and, the heart involvement also tends to get worse. Um, and we definitely saw that in our study. Um, so as people age, the likelihood that they may have heart issues uh, can increase. And so I think that really warrants um, a little bit more careful look. And I, I would definitely recommend, you know, people that are older um, have a cardiologist and feel comfortable with that cardiologist. Um, uh, again, too, uh, and being in general, I think we're talking both about myotonic dystrophy type 1 and myotonic dystrophy type 2. Just a comment about myotonic dystrophy type 2. There are definitely patients with myotonic dystrophy type 2 that are in their 70s and even 80s and may not have any cardiac involvement at all. So, so again, that's reassuring sometimes for that population. Um, for We do know that patients with kind of milder muscle symptoms, uh, they often, you know, can get into their 60s and 70s and and often then cardiac issues will occur. So uh, akin to what we talked about earlier, I would make sure that you have a cardiologist that you're comfortable with, that they're collaborating with, you know, your concerns and uh, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, your parents' concerns uh, and that um, a, a team approaches the care, essentially. I don't necessarily know if it's any any different for, uh, you know, an individual who's kind of caring for their parents, as, as otherwise an individual that's kind of caring for themselves, essentially. I think the things that we address throughout this webinar, people have to worry about and, and, uh, and, and make sure that uh, they're uh, uh, taken care of. That's great. Thanks, Dr. Grove. My next question for you is what is sudden death and is it true that heart issues are the number one cause of death for people living with DM? Yeah. So sudden death is, is an unexpected death. Um, and there's some time frames that we talk about basically. Um, but it's, it's an unexpected death, someone doing well, or maybe even being a little bit, you know, maybe having some medical problems, but all of a sudden um, uh, they have a, they have an issue that, causes them to pass away, essentially. Um, and it's the, the thing that we worry about is, is that can that that sudden death can be the first sign of an arrhythmia in people. And in fact, that's why we worry so much about even patients with asymptomatic abnormalities on the EKG or on asymptomatic abnormalities at EP study, because it could, it actually could kind of prognosticate issues that could happen for the future, including sudden death. If you actually review our 2008 uh, paper on myotonic dystrophy, it actually looked at sudden death in patients with myotonic dystrophy and used the electrocardiogram and the presence of le less life-threatening arrhythmias to predict those, uh, those, those rare events. Um, we do know that patients with myotonic dystrophy, unfortunately, are at higher risk of sudden death. We think most of those are related to arrhythmias, um, but we know that there may be other mechanisms of sudden death. Um, people with significant muscle weakness can have life-threatening pulmonary problems that can occur quickly, either weakness in the muscles, uh, you know, an episode of pneumonia that comes on quickly, or events like aspiration pneumonia, for example, if, if swallowing mechanisms are affected. So, so there may be non-arrhythmia issues, but 
some of our some of the you know the information that we put together regarding pacemakers and defibrillators in myotonic dystrophy are related to trying to decrease the likelihood of sudden death. Again, something that's really devastating, of course, uh, to of course a patient and their family. Um, in our study, we found that cardiac issues and sudden death were the second most common cause of death in myotonic tissue type one. Again, the study was only in myotonic tissue type one. The most common cause of death were actually respiratory problems related to progressive muscle dysfunction. Uh, and um, so something else that, that has to be you know, clearly watched out for. Uh, and then the third most common causes of death were the, the causes of death that the rest of us die from cancer and other issues and things like that. So, so yeah, cardiac issues are definitely important uh, as the number two cause of, of death in myotonic dystrophy. And, and a lot of those deaths can occur su with a sudden death. And so, so it's something that we, and that is one of the reasons, of course, that we're having such an you know, an impetus on patients seeing their heart doctors and getting evaluated. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next question relates to exercise. So what exercise limitations might someone with heart issues living with DM have? And kind of in tandem to that, what kind of aerobic exercises are beneficial or maybe harmful? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, we we don't have a lot of information on that. I mean, I think in general, um, if we we don't think that if patients are exercising to their abilities in terms of you know their other weaknesses, their muscle weakness, that it negatively impacts the heart. Um, so I never restricted exercise in patients as long as they could tolerate it. We we do know that, you know, the heart muscle tends to be like a lot of muscles too, is that strengthening it uh, is, is good. Um, you know, in some patients, if we, if we do see minor pumping abnormalities or cardiomyopathy, we may elect to put patients on some medicine that takes the strain off the heart. It still seems like uh, exercise is good in that. So, uh, so I, I have an early limited exercise in patients. Now, if, if patients notice, for example, severe shortness of breath when they're exercising, uh, you know, if their muscles get weak, uh, if they feel faint or anything like that, then that's an important sign that they should probably limit that and, 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 and likely go to see their medical provider to kind of get those things addressed. Uh, but, um, we don't necessarily have any limitations otherwise. Thank you. Great. Yeah, that makes sense. So my next question is related to diet and food in the heart. Someone asks, is it conducive to us living with DM and heart involvement to completely change our diet? For example, going with a Mediterranean diet or vegan diet. And does this make a difference with the problems that we have? Right. So we do know that diet, you know, the, the most common heart abnormalities in Americans essentially is, uh, you know, blood vessel problems and, and coronary atherosclerosis and hardening of the arteries. And we do know things like a Mediterranean diet and, and vegan diets can positively impact those type of issues. We know much less about um, whether or not they can improve the cardiac issues in myotonic dystrophy. Again, that tends to be a little bit of a different problem. It's not as much a, uh, a problem with the blood vessels, but with the electrical system of the heart and, and kind of a direct effect of the abnormalities of the myotonic dystrophy gene on heart muscle and especially the specialized uh, electrical heart cells. And so we, we don't really know if uh, if a diet will help with that. That being said, of course, um, patients with myotonic dystrophy can get the, you know, the normal heart problems as well, the problems with heart attacks and, and blood vessel issues. And so a good diet, I think, is, is helpful for everybody. I do think, you know, 
making sure that you maintain a good body weight and and uh, will help people uh, to make sure that they can, you know, kind of use their muscles to the most effective way to exercise as much as possible uh, and, you know, keep any strain off the heart that that you normally would have. Um, but unfortunately, we don't necessarily know if any diet itself uh, really helps with that. Um, I'll just answer one other question because I think it relates a little bit. There was some question about uh, cholesterol lowering medicines and whether or not um, they can be used safely. Um, these the medicine statins can cause muscle weakness in a small group of people, both muscle weakness and muscle pain. And uh, um, they're probably our most effective medicines for lowering cholesterol. Um, we don't think that they necessarily have any more negative effect on skeletal muscle in patients with myotonic dystrophy than anybody else. So if, if patients do have kind of, you could say an allergy to those medicines, they, they definitely could have difficulty taking them. So if they get, you know, if they're on a statin medicine, uh, uh, Crestor or some of the other ones, and they get muscle pain or muscle weakness. And if their doctor tests some lab tests and show that there's some muscle breakdown, then then they definitely probably can take those medicines. Otherwise, we think that they can be as effective for patients with myotonic dystrophy for the lowering of cholesterol uh, as other medicines. Um, there are other medicines as well that are used for lowering cholesterol. So if people can't tolerate statin, um, some of those can be given as well. Great. Well, we're talking about medications. We have a few other questions that have come in around medication, okay. specifically around mexiletine. And if there is a risk of taking that once you have a pacemaker, and if so, what should their electrophysiologist be looking for? Well, it definitely... Um, so if you have a pacemaker, then you're able to control the slow heartbeat effectively. So, and that that's a good thing. We do know that some patients with a pacemaker alone can still have episodes of the fast heartbeats, typically ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, which again, it can be dangerous. And so, and the pacemaker itself can't do anything about that, okay? Um, so it's hard to know, I mean, um, and it all depends on kind of where your heart health is and what things you found. Um, but in general, if someone has a pacemaker, I feel more comfortable using mexilatine, but I'll still watch the heart carefully, essentially. And I may do some further monitoring, for example. So I might um, do a 14-day event monitor, uh, which is prolonged recordings to look to see once if there's any change in the abnormal beats from the lower heart part of the heart. Um, you know, I might even consider something, uh, we, we can actually use the pacemaker as well to provide information that. So pacemakers themselves have um, capability of storing uh, if someone has an abnormal heartbeat, so we can sometimes do that. Um, so that's useful information. So I definitely feel more comfortable, um, but I still am potentially worried about someone uh, taking mexilatine with a pacemaker. Generally, if someone does have an implantable cardioverter defibrillator that can treat both the fast and the slow heartbeats, that alleviates my concern a bit more because I know that if that drug is having any effect at all, it can it can treat the heart rhythm essentially. And we can then make decisions about uh, whether mexilatine remains safe for them to take or not. Um, uh, so this, you know, I I, I do know that um, the, the likelihood of those abnormal fast heartbeats, the tachycardia is coming from the ventricle, is relatively low. And so I think if you're if your doctor is comfortable with you taking mexilatine, if you have a pacemaker, even if you have no device, I think, you know, it's reasonable to ask them, you know, again, to, you know, you know, uh, are you, are, are, do you think that my heart health can, can accept, uh, you know, the taking the mexilatine? And I think, you know, if they say, yes, this looks good and this looks good. And I think, you know, based on how severe your myotonia symptoms are, I think the benefits of taking mexilatine outweighs the risk then I think 
you know, again, shared decision making between you and your doctor, then you can go ahead with that if that's what you want to do. Um, and um, so but it but it can it can be a difficult decision sometimes. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. I know we're a little bit over time, but I think we'll just ask a few more questions and okay. then we'll wrap things up. Um, I know during the presentation, you mentioned minor abnormalities with an ECG, and someone asked, when being tested with an ECG, what would fall under said minor abnormalities? Okay. Um, so one of the most common things we see is a minor increase in something called a PR interval, and that's that's the electrical time that it takes to go from the upper chamber of the heart, the atrium, down to the ventricle. And so, and we, you know, in, in our study, we found um, minor abnormalities in that PR interval in about half the patients uh, of, of a middle age, essentially. And so minor abnormalities in the PR interval might be something that, again, that we would do watchful waiting for, or, you know, depending on if the, your doctor had other concerns, that might be a time when they would consider doing the electrophysiologic study to see exactly where is that slow heartbeat, you know, that or that slow conduction coming from. Um, so, you know, that might be a minor abnormality. Uh, there can be some, again, minor changes in uh, the conduction of the heartbeat through the lower chamber of the heart, we call something called the left anterior fascicular block, where, um, you know, that might not prompt me necessarily to do anything more right now. It would prompt me to see the patient a bit more often. I would let the patient know about what we found. And, um, and then, you know, again, with shared decision making, we would decide what, what next to do. So, so th those are type of th things that you can see. Um, uh, so again, to, you know, up to half of patients, again, generally by their middle age, uh, will have some abnormality on their electrocardiogram. And um, not all of that then requires further testing or a pacemaker or defibrillator implant. Our, our study that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that only the more severe abnormalities in the electrocardiogram should re would really warrant a higher risk for you know, the serious heart rhythm disturbances. Uh, and the other thing that we found was that in patients who had atrial fibrillation, that was that was also concerning because atrial fibrillation really correlates with a more severe abnormality in the heart, fibrosis or scarring in the heart that really really makes should make the the doctor and the and the patient take pause and say, "Could other things be going on? Do I need to, you know, I now we we're we're dealing with the atrial fibrillation, but what else do we need to watch out for?" And you know, uh, and so we found that to 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 be one of the most uh, prognostic findings actually for serious heart rhythm disturbances. It's, I mean, unfortunately for for patients too, this is not. This, this is not a disease that's very black and white in terms of, of being able to make decisions that we have, um, you know, really strong data about, right? Because um, although myotonic dystrophy is the most common of the muscular dystrophies in adults, it's still a relatively rare disease. And so that the information we have um, and how to treat people you know, has to be done in a multi-center fashion. And often we don't, we don't, we're not able to really do some of the, the other type of, of studies we call a multi-center randomized controlled trials that are done in some other more common diseases. So, so it's a little bit of the art of medicine and, and making sure that, you know, that patients understand uh, and, uh, understand what's what's being recommended and and they agree. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Well, we'll do one final question and then okay. we'll wrap things up. This question says, are false alarms still a problem with defibrillators? 
Yeah, so it's false alarms. We call those inappropriate shocks, okay? So this is, I mean, you could think about a defibrillator as kind of a, kind of a robot in your chest in some ways. It's monitoring your heartbeat and it, it does that 24-7, 365. And it basically takes the signal from, from the heart, the heartbeat actually, and it says, okay, that's a normal heartbeat. I don't have to do anything but monitor. And if, if that heartbeat turns abnormal, then, then it, it, it has an algorithm that it puts into place through its computer essentially to say, okay, I, I have to start pacing or, oh, this is a fast, fast heartbeat, a tachycardia. I need to make sure it's continuing on going. And if it keeps going, I need to deliver a therapy. That could be a shock, for example. Um, but if a defibrillator delivers a shock, that's actually painful to the patient if they're awake because that shock essentially sends an electrical shock or electrical wave through the body. It, it's, its purpose is to treat the heart, but you know the heart uh, conducts that electricity to the rest of the body and people definitely feel it. Okay. So, and so um, if anything goes wrong with the lead or with the defibrillator, um, sometimes the defibrillator can think that an abnormal heartbeat's going on when it really isn't. And that can lead to something called an inappropriate discharge or inappropriate shock. So, you know, unfortunately, these are man-made devices. They're very, very good. Um, but there can still be issues or problems with those things. Um, sometimes people are in a type of heart rhythm that um, is possibly dangerous, like atrial fibrillation, but that the defibrillator can't do a lot about. And um, a shock is delivered for that, for example. So, um, so yes, we still have to worry about those the inappropriate shocks, and uh, it's something something that again, I think are getting rarer as the technology gets better, but is is still there. So, if you do have an implanted defibrillator, you know, careful follow up with your doctor. Um, almost all of the defibrillators now have home monitoring capabilities. It's typically a, a little device that you put at your bedside and it it monitors all the functions of the defibrillator and typically will find an abnormality before people get a false shock. Um, and but but it's not, nothing is unfortunately foolproof. So uh, you know it's another reason that we are very careful about who we make a decision to put a defibrillator in. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for that great explanation. We'll go ahead and wrap things up. So I just want to thank all of our attendees for your participation. And thank you again to Dr. Groh for both providing this webinar and for helping to develop the DM in the Heart Community Guide. As a reminder, this webinar is recorded and will be sent out within the next week. After the webinar ends, as an attendee, you'll be provided with an option to take a short survey about today's program. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to provide us with feedback. Lastly, if this program spoke to you, please consider showing your appreciation by making a donation via our website. Another great way you can get involved is by joining the Myotonic Dystrophy Family Registry. So thank you all for joining today's webinar, and we will see you next time.